name is Sarah Hardy. I am the curator and manager of the De Morgan collection. And today's Curator at Home talk will be on Evelyn de Morgan's Little Mermaids. So the reason for that is that this uh, painting here, The Little Sea Maid by Evelyn de Morgan, is currently in the exhibition Ulysses, Art and Myth, which is at the Musee San Domenico in Forli in Italy. Uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic, it won't come as a surprise um, to anybody that this exhibition is in lockdown. So currently uh, we're not able to get in there and visit it, which is such a terrible shame when we've worked with our foreign partners uh, and, and this museum um, to put this exhibition project together and to include Evelyn de Morgan's artwork in this narrative. Um, but I hope that we can uh, to, we can help with some understanding and with sharing the exhibition by doing these curator from home talks. So I really hope you enjoy it. If you do enjoy it, as ever, there is a link in the description to donate five pounds uh, or more if you would like. That's of, of course welcome to the De Morgan Foundation for the curator talk. So please do consider us in that as well. So without further ado, the um, the context of this exhibition is based on uh, Ulysses um, from Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. So not very much is known about the ancient Greek poet Homer, but a lot is known about the poems that he wrote. And the first epic poem was the Iliad, which focuses very much on struggle and conflict between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles in the Trojan War. So very well known uh, sort of story there, the, the city uh, of Troy was sieged with the Trojan horse left by the Greeks. The Trojans thought it was a gift and brought it into the city. And of course, at the end of this 10 year battle, this was the, 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 sort of the ultimate uh, thing that happened and the Greeks burst from the horse and took over the city of Troy. But uh, Homer's poem starts a long time before that and focuses, like I said, on this battle between these two key figures in the Trojan story. And that was really at the centre of po Homer's epic poems, um, was the idea that uh, you could use narrative and uh, you could use um, sort of examples uh, and these mythological people and stories, but actually at the centre of that you could uh, sort of explore the human condition and it was in the Iliad that he explored a lot of uh, conflict tension and resolving that, the characters constantly coming to resolutions about the conflict they were having image of a sculpture of Homer there for you as well. Um, the Odyssey really sort of takes over uh, from the end of the Trojan story and it focuses on Odysseus, the Latin name for whom is Ulysses, uh, which since that's the title of the exhibition I will refer to as Ulysses throughout this talk. Um, and in the Odyssey the central figure has a 10-year battle, I suppose, to get home, a 10 year epic journey through time and through uh, different geographic spaces to return home um, to um, Ithaca after the Trojan War. So that's where we pick up with our central character there. Um, and again, whilst there's lots of narrative that goes on in this story, the actual focus of it is the psychological condition of the chief character, Ulysses, and his constant transformation and self-discovery and rediscovery of this idea of self as he's faced with these very difficult obstacles to overcome on his journey as ever if you're journeying through uh, time and space with um, the, the ancient gods who are always sort of throwing um, mischief uh, <laughs> into the mix, which we'll come on to. Um, I think it was quite clever that the title of this exhibition was taken from the title character rather than uh, the, the title of the story, which again just really shows that the focus of this story and how it's been reinterpreted and redeveloped through myth and through art has always been the, uh, the transformation and reimagining of self of this central figure of Ulysses. And I think it's that that has really inspired artists and authors who've responded to some of the ideas in the poem. In particular, uh, Ulysses um, will be most best known to you, not as the title of this exhibition, but as the title of James Joyce, the Irish poet's 1922 uh, epic poem, Ulysses, 
which doesn't focus on 10 years of uh, time and space battling with the gods, but on one man's experience of walking around Dublin in one day, showing that it doesn't matter what the journey is, that uh, sort of self-progression can come in any form. And it's that that really is the, uh, the crucial um, sort of keystone of this exhibition. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, the story was reinterpreted by uh, by Dante, um, and it's that reimagining uh, uh, so some of the earlier uh, artists of the Renaissance and the Baroque, such as Jacob Jordiens, whose picture here, uh, where they focus on the action and the excitement of some of the barriers that uh, the uh, Ulysses comes across on his travels, rather than this inner transformation. So we see here in Jordiens' painting. Um, We've got the central character there, uh, Ulysses, who's broken into the cave of Polyphemus, who is uh, the Cyclops giant, uh, the cannibalistic Cyclops giant. Um, and Dante's reinterpreting of uh, the story just shows this as another sort of epic, uh, dramatic scene in the story. And the artist audience has responded, we think, to that version rather than the original text. As you see here, the scenes being played out rather how it might if you were watching it on the stage. So with the central character in the middle uh, and the action coming at us from the side and then this sort of mysterious uh, sort of depth to the painting by um, by Ulysses' followers coming out, almost you can imagine them coming out of stage flats at the side uh, of the stage there. Um, whereas in the original text, the, uh, the central figure for us, Ulysses actually blinds the Cyclops giant because he's an outsider and a loner, just as Ulysses is, and uh, the characters are supposed to mirror each other, but that's lost a little bit in this painting, as it was like St. Dante's uh, reinterpretation in the Middle Ages of, um, of this uh, this scene and of this story. Uh, other sort of obstacles that poor old Ulysses comes up on his epic 10-year journey uh, to escape back home are the sirens and the exhibition uh, in Italy, the Ulysses exhibition, has really focused on the image of the siren, I think for many reasons. I think it really gets to the crux of the story, this idea of, uh, of transformation and of self-reflectiveness. Um, but also putting it there as this, this obstacle on, on that journey. And this painting in particular that's included in the exhibition, I thought was an interesting one to draw parallels um, to the work of Evelyn de Morgan, which I'll come on to uh, once I finish this introduction. So this is by a contemporary of Evelyn's, an artist called William Waterhouse. And we can see here the siren sitting on this pebbled beach, combing her hair. Her lips are slightly parted and her eyes are staring as though she might be in song. She might have seen sailors and in her very traditional um, depiction, she was there to lure them from their journey to the rocks, cause destruction and in, of course in the sort of very sinister uh, idea to murder them. And you can see in front of her there she has a pleasant bowl full of pearls, which were supposedly the tears of murder sailors. Um, when this painting was first exhibited it was uh, accompanied by stanzas from Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem The Mermaid of 1830 in which she's described as willing herself to be loved. So a very uh, sort of self-referential there um, and transformative element of the human condition. Uh, but Waterhouse stays away from that a little bit and shows her as quite overtly sexualized um, and rather than waiting for love he shows her to be quite a lustful character in this depiction um, which uh, again sort of doesn't really fit in with um, uh, the sort of exact original uh, text, you know, the Hom Homer's version of this, um, this epic tale, but a beautiful painting nonetheless. Uh, the 1901 art journal described her as looking wistful and sad, but I really do think Waterhouse was portraying her as uh, an overtly sexualized character um, and almost using the mermaid just as an excuse really to paint this beautiful young woman. Evelyn de Morgan's mermaids are a little bit different uh, and in order to understand why she was painting mermaids we have to step away from the um, Ulysses text uh, a little bit for a minute if you'll bear with me and work our way through some other texts which more inspired her mermaids than the inclusion of sirens in Ulysses. So here's a, a later painting of some of her mermaid pictures, one that you might be familiar with called the Love Potion. 
Um, and on the shelf behind uh, the, the woman there cooking up this potion, we can see that there's a volume by Paracelsus. Paracelsus was a medieval alchemist um, who worked a lot on different theories of colour and of spirituality. And during his work with alchemy, one idea that he came up with was the idea of Undine, who uh, is a, a humanic form of water. So when he was trying to describe the elements, he humanised these somewhat and came up with the idea of Undine that was later reimagined by Hans Christian Andersen as the Little Mermaid. And it's actually the Hans Christian Andersen story that de Morgan um, presents in her painting The Little Sea Maid and the series of pictures which I'll talk to you a little bit about now but I just thought it was quite interesting that she was also aware of the work of Paracelsus and that she also wanted to um, to have that that underpinning of her story this idea of um, understanding the alchemy behind uh, things like uh, these water nymphs and that uh, you know human forms can be used as a metaphor in painting for many other aspects of them not just um to represent um uh, the, the sort of the water in this story so uh, a sort of double element of literature underpinning this painting so this is believed to be the first in a series and um the hans christian anderson telling of the little mermaid uh, again it's sort of a guy's as a fairy tale um, or as a story that actually explores something a little bit more and something a little bit, uh, again, more sinister, I suppose, than um, is first let on. And what I think really drew Evelyn to Morgan to this story and to want to illustrate this series of paintings is uh, the idea that they explore human spirituality and the idea of the mortal soul. So the story of the Little Mermaid uh, and the Hans Christian Andersen version of that is that a young sea maid is desperate to explore the world above her. And when she turns 15 on her birthday, she can do. She swims up to the shore and falls in love with a prince. Um, obviously, as a mermaid, she can't live on the shore and he, as a human, can't live beneath the water with her. So we have that real sort of idea of uh, unrequited love. There's something in there that um, that drives the Little Mermaid anyway to go and visit the sea witch and she begs her to give her uh, the ability to walk so that she can live on the land. The sea witch does this in exchange for her tongue and her voice. Uh, she drinks the potion and emerges on the land where she's met by the prince. Unfortunately for her, because she doesn't have the the ability to speak she's not able to make him fall in love with her which she has to do before uh, the prince is married otherwise um, she will die a mermaid's death which is to cease to exist rather than to have the human immortal soul so she is desperately in love with the prince he turns to get married to someone else and on that evening um, her sisters make a plea with the sea witch which is that in exchange for their hair they can be given a knife which will allow the princess to kill the prince and his uh, new love interest in order to stop their wedding so that she might not die a mermaid's death. You can see here in Evelyn de Morgan's 1885-6 to six painting The Little Sea Maidens that we have these sisters of the Little Mermaid with all these glorious manes of golden hair. You know, it's an impossible amount of hair that each of them have. And that's alluding to the fact that they're going to sell that in order to get this knife in a bargain with the sea witch so that their younger sister uh, might die a mortal's death and have this immortal soul. So here they are emerging from the waves. Um, you can see that the second one in from the right is looking directly at us uh, to sort of gain our attention and to really sort of look in, into into us looking at them as though we were her sister, the Little Mermaid. And it's really a commanding picture that uh, wants us to have this message. Um, I think it's a very sort of strong and beautiful uh, depiction of this quite uh, pivotal moment in that story. Um, the Little Mermaid, of course, uh, is so in love that she finds it impossible to kill the prince and would rather die herself. This should mean, according to the legend and the magic, that she um, would would die a mermaid's death which is of course not to have uh, an immortal soul and to just cease to exist be turned into the foam on the waves and of course you can see the water foaming a little bit around the mermaids here uh, almost to uh, predict and preempt that um but 
uh, as uh, the, the sun sets and then the sun rises with the new dawn after the prince's marriage, um, the daughters of the air gather round. Uh, and rather than the mermaid disappear into sea foam, what they uh, offer her is uh, 300 years of living as a daughter of the air before her soul can turn immortal um, because she's tried so hard and she's sort of lived this good life uh, without uh, murdering the prince. And what we see here in this final painting, believed to be quite a late one, by Evelyn de Morgan, certainly from uh, around 1910, um, sorry, 1910, uh, you can see these figures here, these daughters of the air, who are surrounded by this beautiful rainbow billowing mist. Of course, rainbow, a symbol of hope and of redemption. And you can see this uh, sort of upward ascension through the figures to the figure at the top, where the light's shining from her, and she's the most ethereal looking of the four figures in that painting, as her soul is ascending after her 300 years of doing good and that uh, creation of her immortal soul. So very much a series of paintings uh, there that focus on this idea of uh, the human condition, of love, of anguish, of the desire for revenge, but also to do good. And um, this progression in through the story of uh, the idea of, um, of the immortal human soul and how that is such a wonderful thing to want to attain. And to Evelyn de Morgan, who was a spiritualist artist, um, that that idea is, was really sort of quite prominent for her to want to present through these series of mermaid paintings. Um, and uh, just a little bit more on the biography of Evelyn de Morgan. She um, met William de Morgan, the ceramicist, in 1883, was married to him by 1887. And it was an introduction to uh, his mother, Sophia de Morgan, who was amongst many wonderful things, such as being a campaigner for prison reforms and uh, the abolition of the slave trade, was also a practicing medium and published her journals on this subject. Um, and I think it was through her uh, that she encouraged her son, William de Morgan, and her daughter in law Evelyn to um, to contact the spirit world and uh, create uh, writings through automatic writing so they they did do that and they firmly believed that human spirits could be contacted and they would often come to them in the guise of angels um, but that sort of underpins all of uh, these paintings that we've looked at today this idea that she firmly believed the progression of this human soul would go through the physical body uh, and then at death would be emancipated uh, into eternity uh, and that is the, very much I think the theme of Hans Christine Andersen's Little Mermaid that encouraged her and inspired her to create her mermaid series rather than the strict narrative and visualisation and representation of mermaids as sirens as was traditional in itself. And it's in this respect that I think her paintings best fit into the exhibition Ulysses. Much as Ulysses went on a voyage of personal discovery and of transformation, Evelyn de Morgan's Little Mermaid did, not just her, the mermaid herself, but particularly her soul and the soul's quest to become immortal. That is really what the, the point of the story is. And it's just sort of covered up by this wonderfully rich visual language and uh, uh, visualisation through the artwork um, that the different artists did. Uh, so I thought uh, that idea of... Uh, you know, our own quest for transformation and uh, for self-discovery um, has really been packaged up over millennia and it's quite interesting to see how different artists um, respond to that and uh, for, for that reason I'm incredibly grateful to the curators at uh, the Musee San uh, Domenico in Forli in Italy for their inclusion of the paintings in the exhibition Ulysses because it's allowed me to align some of Evelyn de Morgan's other paintings with these um, these sort of quite big uh, uh, ideas and these quite different ideas about the paintings to, um, to ones I normally have where I just sort of base them on the fairy story. Uh, so that, um, that concludes um, the talk for today. I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed um, sort of coming along, I, I suppose. And thank you very much for listening to these curator talks. As ever, uh, there is a link to donate to our fundraiser um, in the, the description for this talk. So if everyone would like to give a donation, we usually ask for five pounds for curator talks, um, but more or less, whatever you can afford is very much appreciated as we struggle through this very difficult time where we usually rely 
on donations and entry fees to our museums and collections and exhibitions in order to survive. Um, so please do consider donating today.